Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, September 11th board meeting of the uh, Washington Township Hospital District. It's good to see you all here. I'd, uh, I'd uh, ask you all to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Dee, if you'd take the roll for us, please. Director Stewart. Present. Director Nicholson. Present. Director Wallace. Present. Director Ethan. Present. Director Yee. Present. First thing on our agenda this evening is an education session, and I'd like uh, Kimberly Hartz to introduce that for us. All right, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Prasad Kata. Uh, Dr. Kata began his career at Washington Hospital in 2004 as an endocrinologist. He graduated in medicine from the University of Goldberga, India. He obtained residency in internal medicine at University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey in 2002 and fellowship in endocrinology and meta metabolism, met metabolism from Charles R. Drew University in UCLA in 2004. Dr. Kata became the medical director of the diabetes program in 2014. He's board certified in internal medicine and endocrinology. It's my pleasure to welcome him today and he's gonna be talking about diabetes today. Okay, um, and thanks for the board for inviting me to give this uh, little presentation. So um, <clears throat> let me just uh, make sure. Yeah. Okay, so I'll be talking about the diabetes update uh, mainly in our uh, local population here and some in the uh, general population and about what drugs we are on and where we are. So diabetes in the Tri-City area. So I'll just uh, define the definition of diabetes Look at it, it's a disorder of abnormally high blood sugar levels. Uh, it's either because of insulin, defect, defective insulin production or its utilization of the insulin in the body. Insulin is uh, basically a hormone which is made by pancreas to regulate uh, blood sugars. So what's the lifetime risk of diabetes for a person, a person born in the United States uh, in the year 2000? So about one in three Americans after the year, born in the year after 2000 will be diabetic in their lifetime. And if you go down to Hispanics, it will be one in two. And it's two out of five for African Americans and Hispanics. So the prevalence of uh, diabetes in 2017, this is as per the CDC National Diabetes Statistics Report in 2017. About 30.3 million people are diabetic. That's about 9.4% of our population. Undiagnosed is about 7.2 million. So these people are still walking around without a diagnosis of diabetes. And most likely they're not on any medications. And pre-diabetes is about 84 million. So what's the cost of diabetes in for US if you look at this uh, slide, it shows that for, it was 245 billion in 2012. Uh, that increased to 327 billion in 2017. And if you break down the costs, 43% uh, is attributed to the hospital care. So reason is more patients who have diabetes get admitted to the hospital and they have more comorbidities. So that's one of the main reasons. And 30% goes to medications, including insulin, supplies for diabetes like blood sugar meters, uh, needles, pens, things like that, and medications to treat complications related to diabetes. So the other, you can say 10% each, goes for the doctor healthcare visits, 8% is for nursing homes, other assisted care, and long-term care facility and 10% of the remainder is for other costs. So this is a slide from 2013 to 2015 it from the National Diabetes Statistics Report. If you look, the percentage of population breakdown, if you look at it, there is definitely a higher risk in American Indian and Alaska Natives, about 15%. 
And if you go down, Hispanic, black, non-Hispanic were about 12%, Asian 8%, and white, non-Hispanic is about 7.5%. So in our, coming back to our district, it serves, uh, as we all know, it serves Fremont, Newark, Union City, unincorporated Sunol, and also parts of Hayward. So this is a slide, I think, uh, in which for, this is the numbers from 2014, population 18 and above with uh, diabetes as diagnosis. In the state, it was about 8.8%. So compared to the state, we are actually doing better but there are some problems in local geographic areas. We'll talk about that. If you look at Sunol, it was only about 5.7%. Fremont, about 59 Union City and Newark were higher, 6.5 uh, 6 and 6.4, respectively. This uh, another slide from Diabetes Health, Healthy Eating and Active Living, HEAL. So if you look at the breakdown of our uh, district, uh, I'm not sure if you're able to see here. So this is uh, diabetes hospitalization rate, and this is California, and this is the Tri-City area, or Alameda County here. And California is about 101.7, uh, and Alameda County comes less than that, about 87. But if you look at Fremont, it does better than the Alameda County, but Newark and Union City, uh, they do worse than Fremont and also the Alameda County. So the hospitalization rate for people in that area is higher. And unincorporated Sunol, definitely a lot better than Fremont and also the Alameda County. If you look at the right part of the slide here, uh, diabetes-related indicators, youth obesity, it pretty much follows the same pattern. Newark and Union City do worse uh, than Alameda County and Fremont, and Alameda County does better than California by slightly. So was some of the things which they put out in the report was it may be in this area it's probably too expensive to eat healthy. Culturally specific uh, nutrition recommendations may not be available. And lack of affordable sports and recreational activities for youths and adults. So this is the same breakdown of the, the slide and you can see it a little better here, the obesity and youth here. If you look at it here, new work is about 35%, almost double that of California, and definitely double that of Alameda County, and Union City almost comes around the same. But Fremont is better than California, but higher than Alameda County. So if you look at physical inactivity, again, new work and Union City do worse, both 33 and 32%, but they are better than the Alameda County and California, but in our local geographic area, uh, compared to Fremont and unincorporated, so now they're worse. So we also had to want to see what, what the race and ethnicity di diverse population, how they, uh, how they are in the, our uh, Tri-City area. So this is the breakdown for the Fremont uh, uh, city. Um, Asian is about 50% and white, white is about 30%. Uh, Latino or Hispanic any race is about 14 percent there, and that is in 2014 and 2013. And uh, <clears throat> other races are here. And if you look at new work, uh, definitely there is a, a higher, uh, with respect to higher instead of Latino ra race in new work. And as we saw in the slides earlier, they have a higher risk of diabetes. And if you look at Union City, it's also very similar, higher risk of uh, Latino race. So the other thing is also uninsured population. So if you look at uh, the uninsured population here, uh, Newark and Union City have a higher uh, incidence of uninsured population compared to Fremont. So that can also contribute to hospitalization rates and even Hayward, uh, is uh, definitely higher than even Newark and Union City. So why should we control diabetes? Uh, reason is mainly for cardiovascular risk factors and most patients with diabetes go on to have a heart attack or a stroke um, or an amputation and so on and so forth. So 
it's there is a five times risk of heart attack in a patient with diabetes and two times risk of death due to heart disease so and also six times risk for a stroke so the other complications are more than quarter of all american with diabetes have retinopathy and which can cause lead to vision loss and blindness and about 50% uh, sorry 50000 americans begin treatment for kidney failure every year in us and almost 44% of all new cases with kidney failure is because of diabetes and lastly coming to traumatic amputations sorry uh, coming to amputations um, 73000 lower limb amputations per year which are about almost 60% of all amputations that's not including the traumatic amputations so what are the options for controlling diabetes the first option obviously is diet and exercise and that has to be reminded to the patients every time they come in now how often did they do it that's a very good question it depends on each patient but you have to talk to the each patient about every time they come in to your office and usually my uh, i tell my patients exercise only on the days you eat if you don't eat then you don't exercise so the other options are obviously medications and because diet and exercise doesn't do good for everyone or most of them don't follow it oral medications are there the insulin is the the option and there are also non insulin injectables which are uh, more uh, popular in the last 10 10 to 12 years so i divided the medications into two groups one older medications and most of these medications in this column uh, you can say they are generic except maybe insulin and the newer medications and i've put the year 2005 because around that year there were a lot of new medications which came along and since then uh there have been a lot more medications and it's a lot easier to treat diabetes now than when it was maybe 15 or 20 years ago so this group the biguanides or metformin that's the only medication in that group it works on the liver and i'll go into those uh, details a little bit later There's this group sulfonylurea it works on the pancreas uh pioglitazone or actos it works on the muscles and to some extent the liver too uh this group also meglutonide group that works on the pancreas too uh the alpha glucosidase we don't use this that much this works mainly on your intestine to prevent less uh, absorption of the glucose um and insulin all of us know about that uh the newer medications these are the dpp4 inhibitors which works indirectly on the pancreas uh same thing with this this is actually the non insulin injectables the glp1 which also work on the pancreas indirectly uh this is a newer group in the last 5 to 6 years it's come along the sglt2 group that works mainly on the kidneys actually to prevent the reabsorption of glucose so that's like an innovative way to sort of treat diabetes uh insulin again i put in here because there have been some newer insulins and uh, there are a combination of insulin and also this the glp1 group uh that all, a couple of medications are available and the last one is cycloset which also works on your brain and uh, control your blood sugars so whatever i discussed earlier this slide we call it as the ominous octet it was uh, first coined by uh, an endocrinologist uh, in uh, texas uh, ralph de franzo so basically he has he, if you look at the different organs here all these organs or pathophysiological systems they do raise your blood sugars if you either have excess of something or you don't have some things for that reason so now if you have don't obviously we know that pancreas produces insulin if you have less insulin that raises your blood sugars and if you are not able to control your appetite because of these lack of these enzyme uh, of the lack of these hormones that again uh, causes high blood sugar the glucose reabsorption which i mentioned earlier if you are absorbing too much of glucose back into your blood stream that causes high blood sugar and the glucose uptake and uh, utilization that again um by the muscle and also to some extent the liver causes high blood sugars uh and uh, if you don't if you produce too much glucose because of the liver one of the functions of the liver is to produce too much is to produce glucose when you're not eating that causes high blood sugar 
and also these uh, the intestine these are hormones which indirectly act on the pancreas with help of these incretins um, to decrease the production of glucose from the liver and also increase the production of insulin so that's the reason we need different medications and uh, we have to try and treat patients uh, if they are not controlled with one or two medications we may have to change over or add on one or two different other medications and see them uh, so every three months or four months and then go from there. So this is a busy slide and uh, this is an ADA schematic table. So I'll just uh, go over it uh, uh, slowly and see um, if there's, uh, I'll definitely take questions later on. So the first usually what ADA says is go with metformin, which is the medication which works on the liver. Since recently over the last three years, there has been good amount of data that some medications, if you use them, they do prevent heart attacks and stroke in patients with diabetes. That was not the case until the last about three or four years ago. So for that reason, what they have said is, if you have had a history of heart disease or heart failure, so you have to think about those medication first line. So why are we trying to tre you know, treat patients with diabetes? To prevent heart attack and stroke down the line. So for that reason, you have to use the GLP-1s and the SGLT2s. Uh, the GLP-1s work on the pancreas indirectly and the SGLT2s work on the kidneys. So if patients don't have that from metformin, you can go to any one of these, the DPP-4s, the GLP-1, the SGLT2s, or the TZDs. And if they are not controlled, you have to add on medications. So that goes on like this. If, again, if you're only treating with respect to blood sugars and you also want to minimize hypoglycemia, which is low sugars. So that's, that's where when you want to use these medications. If you want to minimize weight gain and promote weight loss, they again say you can use GLP-1s or SGLT-2s because these two medications help patients to lose weight. And the last one, if cost is a major issue, for a lot of patients that is an issue. So then we'll have to, metformin is a generic medication, then you can use sulfonylureas or TZDs which are also generic. But usually they come with some caveat of they do gain weight. So again, the important thing here is, I may, I'm not sure if you can see this, they say you need to prevent clinical inertia. So what that is is, as physicians and also as patients, they don't blame anyone, they say, if patients don't want to take medication, you have to ask them to come back and maybe take take some time, okay, three months, okay, tell them three months later on, we'll have to discuss. If, you do, if you're not at goal, we'll have to add in a new medication or do something else because that's clinical inertia. And a lot of times, the clinical inertia happens because of the patient and it can also because happen because of the physician if the physician doesn't want to start a medication. And this is the American Association of uh, Clinical Endocrinology Guidelines which is, uh, they uh, have actually been more uh, forthcoming and what to say, uh, to be, uh, they have been ahead of the ADA, I should say, for a long time. And uh, they basically have said, if you look at these green lines here, the length of the green line basically represents the, how effective the medications are. If the longer and darker the green line, then they're more effective. So as we saw in the last line, we said the first two ones we have to probably use after metformin is the GLP-1 and the SGLT-2s. And it's pretty much the same here. The GLP-1, SGLT-2, because they think these medications are more effective in treating diabetes. And also they do prevent heart, heart attacks and strokes in these patients in the long run. So. If they don't work, and if your A1C is less than seven, uh, uh, then that should be seven, seven and a half, that should be fine. If not, you add on a second medication. If not, a third medication. If not, then you'll have to go on to insulin, and so on and so forth. Again, they do say if you have to use TZDs and sulfonylureas, there is a issue with weight and low blood sugars, and those are the things uh, we'll have to talk to patients when they come in. So. As uh, patients, what, what do they need to ask their physicians? They definitely need to ask about their A1C. 
and I'm sure most physicians are telling patients about their A1C, and this needs to be checked probably every three months if they're not controlled, and if they're controlled, then maybe every four months to six months should be fine. And the A1C goal for most patients is less than seven, um, if possible, even less than six and a half, because uh, younger the patient, and if they don't have any other comorbidities, we want them to be less than six and a half. So, how do we sort of explain A1C to a patient? Basically, hemoglobin A1C is you're checking the, the sugar content on the hemoglobin. So sugar content on the red blood cells. So this is a normal red blood cell uh, with the sugar coating here. So this is, let's say, a diabetic patient with a sugar coating. So there's a lot more sugar on the red blood cell. So what we are measuring is basically the sugar content on the red blood cell of the patient. And since the lifespan of the red blood cell is about 90 to 120 days, you have to do it every three to four months. Uh, so every three months, if not control, or adjusting medications, and every four to six months, if stable, or if you're not adjusting medications. Again, where should your A1C be? We, get, we discussed that, seven, better six and a half. And if you go down, you don't want patients to be 9, 10, 11, or 12, or 13. We are okay with, even with patients who have comorbidities and other things, you're okay with maybe seven and a half, eight, or if they live alone, I'll, I'll come to that. Uh, I think that's probably the next slide. Um, the goals for uh, sugars, if you look at it, the American Diabetes Association says A1C, uh, sorry, uh, blood sugar of less than 130 before eating, and after eating should be less than 180. And for the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, it's 110 and 140. So this is the slide I was talking about. So if your risk is low, you want to be more stringent. So what does this depend upon? Risk, it depends upon so many different factors. One is the disease duration. If you've had diabetes for 30 years, then patient, patient may not be that motivated. And if they're not, you would want to sort of be less stringent with them than um, be more stringent. And if potentially associated hypoglycemia, low blood sugars, again, you have to be less, less sort of stringent than more stringent. Life expectancy is long, then you want to be more stringent. If your life expectancy is few years you know, then you have to be less stringent. Again, comorbidities like, uh, uh, like say renal failure or heart disease, if they're absent, you're being more stringent. If you're there present, then less stringent. And uh, <clears throat> patient attitude, expected treatment efforts, and also resources and support systems. If you have an old lady who lives by herself and she's taking insulin four times a day, you want to be definitely less stringent. And if, if you have support systems, someone lives with her all the time, then probably a little more stringent. So the good news is uh, by managing the ABCs of diabetes, uh, you can pretty much reduce the risk of their complications. A stands for, again, A1C, we want it to be less than seven. B is for blood pressure, which is less than 130 by 80. And C stands for cholesterol. In most patients, we want it to be less than 70. 100 is probably also acceptable. Again, uh, delaying or preventing complications. If you reduce your A1C by 1%, um, the complications of eye, kidney, and nerve damage almost decrease about 25 to 30%. And this, again, was a study which was done in the late 90s in the United Kingdom. But now, again, there are studies, as I told you, for preventing heart attacks and strokes uh, with respect to treating diabetes. So that was not there about, let's say, 20 years ago. So to prevent other complications, yearly urine exam for protein and yearly examination of eyes and also examination of the feet, maybe every three months, if not at least every six months, and also tell patients to examine their own feet um, um, means at least uh, one every day or every other day, and they have to take a look at to see if there is any problem. And dental exam every six months. So how is uh, our Washington Outpatient Diabetes Program helping the community? Um, our Outpatient Diabetes Program was recognized by the ADA about 12 years ago. It was about uh, 2,300 visits last year, and they had conducted about 80 classes. 
Um, some of them are one-to-one -one and some of them are group classes. Uh, diabetes Matters, they get a speaker and uh, they every other month and the diabetes support group is held every month. And they also have an annual diabetes health fair in November and the annual diabetes awareness day um, in the hospital and the community health fairs education and they do have a booth at concert in the park. And the, also we have a diabetes advisory team. Um, uh, we have the mission statement for that and that as the purpose is mainly to provide evidence-based care for the with patients with diabetes in the Washington Township Healthcare District throughout the continuum of care, um, both outpatient and inpatient. Oversee the outpatient diabetes program to successfully maintain the ADA program recognition. And our task is to monitor guidelines and also recommend them from the prof different professional organization, glucose management and disseminate information, and also foster support interprofessional collaboration and optimize patient outcomes and minimize adverse events. And also to contribute important knowledge for all healthcare, improved knowledge for healthcare professionals. Um, identify strategies to improve successful transition from inpatient to outpatient. And I think we do still have to do some, we have some work here we'll, we'll have to do, but we are working on that. Annually review the activities of the outpatient diabetes program. So that's the end of my talk, and if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you very much. That's very, very interesting. Yeah. I was uh, yeah. interested that the Hispanic population has such a high uh, percentage of diabetes. <coughs> One in two women, is that true? Yeah, one in two women who have been born after the year 2000 will, be di di will have diabetes in their lifetime. Wow, that's sobering. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions from the board? Uh, Jean? No. Uh, Dr. Kata, I yeah. um, appreciated your talk. My big concern is about the youth and the children and the lack of exercise uh, the too much screen time <laughs> and too much in the way of sugary drinks and snacks, high carb snack foods and the obesity resulting from that and eventually that will produce diabetes in a lot of them I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Are there specific recommendations that you could give to parents of children to help them change their kids behavior? That's, I think, is a <laughs> very difficult question to answer. But again, I mean, see, I think whatever has to be done, it should probably, it should be in like a nationwide approach and all with all, including advertising. Even if you look at the advertise, the what, if you look at what kids watch and the advertisements, the most of it is all high carb food and what they are. It means again, school should approach uh, that they shouldn't have probably any soft drinks, uh, vending machines, so on and so forth. The, the issue is, again, it, it's a, it should be a multi-pronged approach. Again, uh, just uh, by talking to parents, I'm not sure how much it'll work. Uh, it should be a multifaceted or multi-pronged approach for treating this. Uh, again, you know how it easy it is to take a cell phone away from a kid. Uh, so, as I said, it's a very difficult uh, means question to answer, but again, it should be multifaceted or multi-pronged approach. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Very important issue. We'll now have a consideration of minutes uh, for August 14th, 19th, 26th, and 28th of uh, 2019. Do I have a motion on that? So moved. Looking for second. a second. Second. We have a motion and a second. D, if you would take the role in approving those minutes. Mm -hmm. Director Stewart. Aye. Director Nicholson. Aye. Director Wallace. Aye. Director Epen. Aye. Director Yee. Aye. That motion passes. Thank you. Uh, it's time for communications. Uh, are there any oral communications this evening? There are not. Thank you. We'll now go to our written communications and Dr. Killaroo, our Chief of Staff. Thank you. We have two uh, 
New applicants uh, for initial uh, to your appointment. Uh, first is Dr. Duck Min Tran, emergency room physician. Um, and the second is Dr. Elizabeth Travathan. Uh, she's an internal medicine hospitalist joining the Apollo Medical Foundation. We have no one-year reappointments. We have Amanda Best, a cardiac perfusionist, asking for temporary privileges. Um, no locum tenens, no 30-day extensions, no waiver requests. We have several candidates, total 23, for reappointment for two years. Dr. Natasha Balin, pediatrics, Dr. Archana Bindra, endocrinology, <coughs> Dr. Sanjay Bindra, cardiology, Dr. Michael Brook, pediatric cardiology, Dr. Patrick Burke, pediatrics, Dr. Demetra Burrs, OBGYN, Dr. Mark Kokalis, pediatric cardiology, Dr. Chiara Espiritu, pediatrics, Dr. Crystal Avey, internal medicine, Dr. Peggy Feng, pediatrics, Dr. Benjamin G. Diagnostic Radiology, Dr. Tracy Hune, Interventional Cardiology, Dr. David Jackson, Telemedicine, Robert Leatherbury, Cardiac Perfusionist, Dr. Walter Lee, Pediatric Cardiology, Dr. Christopher Ma, Podiatry, Dr. Lindsay Matthew, Internal Medicine, Dr. Derek Obayashi, Pediatric Cardiology, Dr. David Pang, Orthopedics, Dr. Matthew Pantel, pediatric hospitalist, Dr. Divyang Patel, podiatry, Dr. Nancy Sherpa, family medicine, Dr. Jeffrey Stewart, anesthesiology. We have several one-year reappointments, Dr. <coughs> Andre Gay, orthopedics, Dr. Jill Harrell, orthopedics, Dr. Gautam Parikh, internal medicine, Dr. William Stearns, orthopedics, Dr. Sarah Wortman, vascular surgery. We have a conditional reappointment, Dr. Uh, Apolinar Gakoti. We have uh, Dr. Kai Oyu for non-reappointment, deemed to have resigned. In transfer of staff category, we have Amanda Best, cardiac perfusionist, uh, going from provisional active allied health to allied to active allied health. Uh, Dr. Archana Bindra, endocrinology. Dr. Chiari Espiritu. Um, pediatrics both going from active to ambulatory. Dr. Peggy Fang, pediatrics also going from active to ambulatory. Dr. William McNutt, uh, intensivist critical care. Dr. Gurinder Singh, internal medicine hospitalist, both going from provisional active to active. And finally, we have Dr. Susan Will Turner, going family medicine, going from provisional active to ambulatory. Uh, completion of proctoring and advancement in staff category, we have Jalriza Mansuri, uh, OBGYN and neonatal circumcision. Uh, we have no new privileges requested. We have several physicians deleting privileges. Dr. Sanjay Bindra in cardiology, Dr. Dimitra Burr, OBGYN, Dr. Andre Gay in orthopedics, Dr. Tracy Huyen in interventional cardiology. Dr. Andre Gay, Dr. Gautam Parikh, and Dr. Jeffrey Stewart all updated their conflict of interest statements. We have reinstatement from leave of absence, uh, Amanda Best, who's coming back from her maternity leave, cardiac perfusionist. And finally, resignations, we have Dr. Niti Doshi, pediatric hospitalist, Dr. James Fields, internal medicine hospitalist, Dr. Narayan Agunda, internal medicine hospitalist, Dr. Uma Kantamaneni, internal medicine, Dr. Sung Hoon Kim, pediatric surgery. Dr. R Richard Long, urology. Dr. Mihir Patel, internal medicine hospitalist. And Dr. Michael Stevens, internal medicine hospitalist. Do I have a motion for accepting the medical staff? So moved. <clears throat> so moved. Do we have a second? Second. Motion and a second will take the roll. Uh, D, if you would do that. Director Stewart? Aye. Director Nicholson? Aye. Director Wallace? Aye. Director Eben? Aye. Director Yee? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Now, now move to our service league report. Ruth, it's good to see you. Good to see you. Good evening. Um, I want to report on a recent conference that I attended. It was the CAUSE Conference, the California Association <laughs> of Hospitals and Health Services. It was their mini conference that they do during the year. We had a, a keynote speaker was um, <laughs> Peggy Wheeler, and Peggy Wheeler is the cause 
lobbyist for the state of California, and she came to the conference to speak to volunteers as to inform us on the homeless, the SB 1152 um, bill that had passed. So there was a lot of discussion about how volunteers at various hospitals and organizations had helped their organizations provide clothing for um, their departments. One of the interesting ones was from a hospital in Southern California who talked about there, they had multiple facilities, and so the homeless amongst themselves had gotten together and talked and decided which hospitals they wanted to go to because they had different clothing when they left. Some had matching uh, sweatsuits and others were just giving out sweatshirts, and so it became apparent amongst their community that they should look to purchase all of their clothing from one particular vendor. And so the vendor that they had selected, which was uh, kind of amazing to me, some of you may remember the name, is Bob Barker. Um, so Bob Barker has a supply line where you can buy clothing and so some of the organizations are buying it there because of the pricing that they're obtaining. So it's very interesting. Um, as volunteers, she said that we do not per, per se need to know all of the intricacies of homelessness, but we need to know how our organization handles homelessness and what we can do as volunteers to help out for that. So it was um, very interesting as she talked about her role as a lobbyist and the things that didn't make it through that some of the lobbyists for the hospitals were able to keep out of that bill, but in the long run, it left the organizations and the hospitals with a mandate for which there is no funding from the state. And so it was um, very interesting to hear her speak about that. Thank you. Nice to be updated on that. That's a problem we all are dealing with. Yes. At the moment. Thank you. Uh, our medical staff report, Dr. Gillerow. Thank you. So we have a total of 592 uh, medical staff members, out of which we have 372 active uh, and uh, 46 provisional active members. Hospital calendar. Uh, All right, we'll, if you we'll start present. with the uh, calendar. <coughs> Past Health Promotions and Outreach Events The 2019 Central Park Summer Concert Series presented by Washington Hospital Healthcare System concluded on Thursday, August 15th with an estimated attendance of 3,500. This free six-week concert series was open to the public and held at the Central Park Performance Pavilion on Thursdays from 6 to 8 p.m. Washington Hospital provided health information. Also on Thursday, August 15th, as part of the Women Empowering Women series, Dr. Victoria Leaphart, gynecologist, presented Don't Let Arthritis Slow You Down. Twelve people attended. On Wednesday, August 21st, Dr. Victoria Leaphart presented Laugh Without Leaking, Understanding Female Urinary Incontinence. Eighteen people attended. On Thursday, August 22nd, Dr. Steven Zahner, Family Practice and Sports Medicine Specialist, presented Concussion, the Invisible Injury, as part of a professional development session for the Fremont Unified School District Health Services team. 20 people attended. On Monday, August 26th, as part of the Women's Health Strategies for Wellness series, Dr. Vanessa Wilson, Internal Medicine, presented Depression, More Than a State of Mind. 19 people attended. On Thursday, August 29th, Dr. Natalie Tett, intensivist, and Dr. Shaker Srinivas, emergency medicine, presented Learn the Signs and Symptoms of Sepsis. 28 people attended. In 2014, Washington Hospital was designated as a baby-friendly hospital by the World Health Organization. Washington Hospital is committed to supporting new breastfeeding mothers and their babies. On Wednesday, September 4th, the Birthing Center received the redesignation announcement demonstrating the continued dedication to delivering the best possible care for mothers and newborns. On Thursday, September 5th, the Washington Hospital Food and Nutrition Services Department donated 42 cases of food items to the Alameda County Food Bank. Did you know patients with peripheral vascular disease, PVD, have a higher rate of early mortality? Today, approximately 50% of patients who have PVD also have vascular blockages elsewhere in the body. The risk factors for PVD are similar to those for heart disease and stroke. 
aging, family history and cardiovascular disease, smoking, diabetes, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol. If left untreated, patients with PVD can develop serious health problems, including heart attack, stroke, renal artery disease, and amputation. Diagnosing PVD can be as simple as performing a painless, non-invasive Doppler ultrasound investigation of the patient's leg circulation. On Saturday, September 7th, Washington Hospital hosted a peripheral vascular disease screening event. This free screening included a Doppler study. Dr. Ashchain, cardiologist, and vascular surgeons Dr. John Thomas Mahegan and Dr. Sarah Wartman provided interpretation of results. This event was co-sponsored by Fremont Bank Foundation. A total of 57 people were screened. Of the 57, five were found to have possible arterial disease of the lower extremities, and 15 were found to have other vascular issues requiring follow-up. On Monday, September 9th, as part of the Women's Health Strategies for Wellness series, Dr. Stacy Berry, Obstetrics and Gynecology presented Women's Health Through the Years, Screening's Key to Aging Well. 17 people attended. Upcoming health promotions and community outreach events. On Thursday, September 12th, from 6 to 8 p.m., Dr. Timothy Orlip, Ear, Nose, and Throat Specialist will present Suffer from Sinus Problems? On Tuesday, September 17th, from 3 to 5 p.m., Dr. Jennifer Chan, Thoracic Surgery, will present Learn the Latest Treatment Options for Gastroesophageal Reflux Disease, GERD. On Wednesday, September 18th, from 6 to 8 p.m., Christy Caracappa, Health Insurance Information Service Coordinator, will present New to Medicare, What You Need to Know. On Thursday, September 19th, as part of the Women Empowering Women series, Dr. Victoria Leaphart and Father Jeff Finley, Palliative Care Coordinator, will present the Five Wishes Advanced Care Planning. On Monday, September 23rd, from 6.30 to 8 p.m., as part of the Women's Health Strategies for Wellness series, Dr. Stacy McDonald, Obstetrics and Gynecology, will present Reproductive Health, Planning for Pregnancy. On Thursday, September 26th, from 6 to 8 p.m., at the Washington Township Medical Foundation Nakamura Clinic Conference Room in Union City, Dr. Victoria Leaphart will present Healthy Gut, Healthy You. On Tuesday, October 1st, from 10 a.m. to noon, Christy Caracappa will present Medicare Open Enrollment, What You Need to Know. On Thursday, October 3rd, from 7 to 8 p.m., as part of the Diabetes Matters Program, Anna Mazze, RD, will present Asian Fusion. This presentation will explore modifying traditional recipes to make them healthier without losing their distinctive flavors. On Tuesday, October 8th and Tuesday, October 15th, Melissa Reyes, RN, will provide a two-part education series on stroke. Part 1, Stroke Prevention, will educate community members about prevention, symptoms, and what to do if you are experiencing signs of a stroke. Part 2, Life After Stroke, is an overview on how to better understand your condition and how to move forward after a stroke. Bay Area Healthier Together Washington Hospital's partnership with ABC7 continues to provide health-related information and education through on-air programming and on bayareahealthiertogether.com. The featured topic during the month of August was sports injuries and proper rehabilitation, featuring Dr. Russell Nord, orthopedic surgeon and medical director of Washington Sports Medicine, plus articles on concussion care and cupping therapy. The Washington Hospital Healthcare Foundation Report. On Saturday, October 12th, the Washington Hospital Healthcare Foundation will host the 33rd annual Top Hat Dinner Dance. This year's co-chairs, City of Fremont Chief of Police Kimberly Peterson and Drs. Rohit and Seema Sagal promise a wonderful evening of fine dining and lively entertainment. Proceeds from the evening will benefit Washington Hospital's Women's Center with the purchase of 3D mammography equipment. This cutting-edge technology has been proven to produce clear diagnostic images, making it easier for physicians to detect abnormalities, reducing instances of false positives and unnecessary biopsies. Guests can purchase individual tickets or tables of 10, 
The Foundation also welcomes new and returning sponsors to the gala. To reserve seats at Top Hat or inquire about sponsorship opportunities, please call the Foundation at 510-818-7350. Washington on Wheels WOW Mobile Health Clinic The Washington on Wheels Mobile Health Clinic WOW is a mobile medical unit providing quality health care services primarily to uninsured and underserved district residents. WOW brings Washington Hospital's commitment to patient-first care to clients throughout the district. During the month of August, WOW served community members at the following locations. In Fremont, the Family Resource Center, Bay Area Community Services, BAX, TCV Food Bank and Thrift Store, and the Irvington Presbyterian Church. In Union City, the Ruggeri Senior Center, Alvarado Resource Center, Union City Family Center, and Our Lady of the Rosary Church. In Newark, the Viola Blythe Community Services Center. These community partners provide social services to families in need and the homeless population. WOW also provided sports physicals for athletes of the Union City Football and Cheer League at James Logan High School in Union City. The total number of community members receiving health care from the Washington on Wheels Mobile Health Clinic during the month of August was 81. Internet and Social Media Marketing Washington Hospital's website serves as a central source of information. The hospital's employment section was August's most viewed web page with 42,061 views. Washington Hospital has an active social media presence. Through these channels, we update the community with news on events, services, and patient care. Connecting with our community through social media continues to grow. Our most popular social media content during August was focused on our UCSF Washington Cancer Center, which achieved 4,500 impressions. That feature informed Tri-City area residents about expanded access to oncology clinical trials and provided information on the work of our senior clinical research coordinator. Users can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Washington Hosp. In Health, Channel 78. During the month of August, Washington Hospital's cable channel 78 in Health captured new programming, including a health and wellness program titled Laugh Without Leaking, Understanding Female Urinary Incontinence, and a women's health strategies for wellness series program called Depression, More Than a State of Mind. In addition, in Health aired a Diabetes Matters program called Dining Out Around the World and the August Board of Directors meeting. Additional events and announcements. To honor Patricia Pat Danielson for her longtime service to our hospital and the communities we serve, the Washington Township Healthcare District Board officially changed the Washington Township Medical Foundation Newark Clinic name to Danielson Clinic Newark. On Monday, August 26th, a special ribbon cutting event was held to celebrate the clinic's new name and to honor Pat, who was in attendance and helped cut the ribbon. The event was attended by members of the Board of Directors, Newark Mayor Al Nagy, leaders from the community, and from Washington Hospital Healthcare System. Pat served on the board for 18 years. During her tenure, Washington Hospital Healthcare System improved care for the community by expanding many programs and services and the Washington Hospital campus. An active member of the Newark community, Pat tirelessly gave her time to community organizations, including Newark Days, Safe Alternatives for Violent Environments, Newark Optimist Club, Mission Valley ROP, and the New Haven Education Foundation. Awards and Recognitions the DAISY Award is presented to a nurse who shows exceptional patient care. A special award was presented to the team of 3WEST. DAISY is an acronym for Diseases Attacking the Immune System. This award was started in 1999 by the family of J. Patrick Barnes, who died of idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. His family established the award to honor Patrick and to thank nurses who, with their clinical skills, compassion, and extraordinary work, impact the lives of patients and their families. Patients have provided numerous compliments on the professional and compassionate care they or their loved ones received on 3WEST. 
The department quality dashboard reflects the staff commitment to patient safety on the unit. The three West quality audits have consistently outperformed in the following clinical areas. Falls without injury, CLABSI, 16 months since last case, CAUTI, 12 months since last case, C. diff, hospital acquired, seven months since last case. For more information on any of the programs mentioned, visit whhs.com or call 800-963-7070 and please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. All right, um, I'd like to present now the September Employee of the Month, Hong Lee, Certified Nursing Assistant um, in the Nurse uh, Float Pool. Our, sep our September Employee of the Month, Hong Lee, says, when you like what you're doing, your heart carries you. Working as a certified nursing assistant, Hong has days that can be challenging, but working with wonderful coworkers and knowing she's doing things that make patients' days a little better helps Hong stay centered. In 2005, on a recommendation by Dr. Daniel Morgan, Hong completed certified nursing assistant training and joined the Washington Hospital family. A cancer survivor herself, Hong knows that some patient days are better than others. On a bad day, a patient is grateful for the extra care that CNAs provide, and floor nurses always appreciate the extra assistance given by CNAs. According to her nurse manager, Hong instinctively motivates and supports her peers. She is the ultimate team player and is greatly admired by everyone. Hong understands that the patient-first ethic is not always what the patient wants, but rather what is best for the patient. She says, sometimes it is hard to explain to them that something that may be uncomfortable, like changing positions, is necessary. Nursing management appreciates Hong's abilities so much that new employees are routinely assigned shifts with her so that they can pass the Hong standard before they work independently. When Hong says they are ready, we feel confident new staff members will be successful in their role. Hong and her family came to the Bay Area from Vietnam when she was 10 years old. Her son, Kevin, was raised in, New in Newark and is currently a student at San Jose State University in their nursing program. Hong and her son enjoy fishing, crabbing, and taking walks with their dog, Salty. Both at work and at home, she feels she has a lot to be thankful for. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you. <clears throat> We're now ready for our lean report. Uh, this evening it'll be on the infusion clinic and the on oncology quality improvement area. Kimberly, if you could introduce that yes, for I'd us. Yes, I'd like to introduce um, two of our presenters <clears throat> tonight. Uh, the first is Rochelle McCarthy, and she is the UCSF Washington Oncology Program Director. And Rochelle joined Washington Hospital as the director of our UCSF Washington Cancer Center in January of 2017. Rochelle graduated from Bloomberg University in, in 1995 with her BSN. She has worked as an RN and in administration both in hospital and outpatient settings. She re relocated from Pennsylvania to the Bay Area in 2006. Rochelle has a strong desire to bring exceptional cancer care to the community setting. Our next presenter uh, is Sherry Kellen, and she's the Infusion Center Nurse Manager. Sherry has worked for Washington Hospital for 26 years as a certified nurse assistant, unit clerk, and transporter before pursuing her nursing degree. She became a registered nurse in 1999, graduating from Ohlone College with an associate degree in nursing. She obtained her postgraduate degree at the University of San Francisco and in 2017 graduated with a master's degree in clinical nurse leadership. She developed a passion for oncology nursing while working in the inpatient oncology unit, received her certification in oncology nursing, and transitioned to the outpatient infusion center when it opened in 2011. She has recently moved into the role of nurse manager at the infusion center and is working towards a certification in lean. So I want to introduce both of them. They can begin. I'd like to thank the board for allowing us to come this evening to showcase our work, and I'd like to especially thank the executive leadership team at Washington Hospital for always being so supportive to us. Special thanks to you, Kimberly, Stephanie, Donald, Ed, 
and also to Dr. Kirk John for helping us with this work. It isn't always easy, um, but it has been a lot of fun. We picked this particular slide because I do, I do feel it's the heart of what an A3 is. It's everybody's hands coming together to really come to a common goal, and in the center of it all is our patient, and that is really um, what we're hoping to accomplish with all of the work that we put um, forth in the infusion center. Um, so for, uh, just to give a highlight of the infusion center and what it is and the services we provide, obviously it does provide ke uh, chemotherapy and immunotherapy, but in addition we do give antibiotics, hydration, tran blood transfusions, we do insert pick lines and provide care. There is a direct collaboration with the UCSF um, oncologists, Dr. David Lee and Dr. F. Timia. They do help to support the infusion center as well. We have, um, just to, to give a feel for the number of patients we see, in 2018, we saw 2,911 patients. The hours that the infusion center are open are eight to five. We do accommodate patients. If patients are there late, the nursing staff are really flexible and we do the best we can to meet the needs of our patients. We currently have 10 staff members and we have eight infusion bays and this is just the area where patients receive their care and we do have a private room for patients that are particularly sick. This is, um, I wanted to pull a graphic together just so we can see um, a couple of things. I'll kind of want you to think back to this slide as we move through the processes we've done just to understand some of the growth. The red line indicates the number of patients that were seen in the infusion center in 2016. In 2017 is when Washington uh, began the collaboration with uh, Washington Hospital and UCSF. And that is the blue line highlighting the number of visits that were seen during that time frame. And then the purple line would be 2018, and then the green line is 2019. So when the collaboration began, our goal was really to provide the highest level of care to the patients in the community, and really to expand services, and hopefully to grow the program. And so we have been successful in growing the program. Um, however, we have still, still the same amount of chairs, so we need to really see how we can best treat that number of patients in those chairs. So we wanted to um, talk about some of the process improvement we did and really highlight what A3 thinking is. And for anybody that's not here, I just wanted to kind of explain it. A3 thinking, actually what A3 means is it's just the size of the paper. So all of the work that we do fits on this paper. Um, what we, it is is really coming to a problem that you don't know a resolution to and understanding it so well that the process works itself out and so it's nice when things work well and it's nice when things go into place but a lot of times there's a lot of work and revision that go into these processes. So um, the paper does display what the current state is and what the current state means is today if you were to go into the department what is happening right now. And then the problem, it'll clearly outline what, what we're, what's preventing us from doing what we need to get done. And then the analysis is really looking deep into the heart of the problem and really understanding what's happening or what's going wrong. And then of course solutions. And as a nurse, we always like solutions. So I'm always trying to get there. So the document itself um, is on the paper. Mm -hmm. It lines out the left side and the right side. And on the left side, it defines what the problem is, why is it a problem, and what's happening. And it also looks at what is it that we want to do better and what is the root cause. And sometimes this is really hard and it takes the most amount of time. And the really important thing to remember about this document is you can't get to the right side until you truly understand the left side. And then once you get to the, um, to the right side, you're looking at what can we try, what are our countermeasures, what can we learn, and then um, the other thing to really keep in mind, it really follows the Plan, Do, Check, Act. And so as we're looking at it, we're constantly looking at it and making changes. It's really dynamic. It's not a static form. We can't put it into place and say this is what we're going to do and it's going to work because we really don't know what's going to work until we work through it. And so what I really like about this process with the lean methodology is it's not, it takes out a lot of um, personal feelings and it really takes out a lot of subjectivity and really lets a whole entire team come to a problem and try to figure out what might work and what might not work. And sometimes when you're looking at that problem, I'll be the first person to say, I'm like, oh, I don't think that's gonna work, but we wouldn't know if we don't try. And so it really takes a lot of teamwork and it really, I think, really fosters teamwork and builds teamwork. 
and Sherry has been the manager there, but before that she was the charge nurse, and she has always exemplified what that leadership is, and I really want to thank Sherry for all of the support and pro um, she's provided to the program, and the, there's an exceptional team. If anybody that's ever encountered the Infusion Center, I've never seen nurses so driven and so passionate about really wanting to do what's best for patients, and I think that's what drives a lot of our process improvement and really what drives nurses to want to continue to do better for their patients. And so this is just an example of um, our A3 on the top right hand corner is the one that we started and initiated and then oftentimes um, I think as we look at a problem we find that it's not just one problem they're problems that kind of build off of another problem mm -hmm. and so sometimes when you do process improvement work it does lead right into another process improvement work but that's part of growing and I think part of moving on and so with that in mind our first project that we looked at is um, We've started to hear from some patients when they were there that they had come to the infusion center and they felt like they were waiting for a period of time before their medication arrived. And so we felt that it was really important to look at that problem. And so starting all the way back in 2017, we first identified that problem and we've put a lot of work into place and we continue to put a lot of work into place. As we're growing, we're finding it more challenging to meet that turnaround time because we're seeing more patients and really trying to turn patients over in a timely manner. And so it really took a thoughtful analysis and there were a lot of causes that were actually leading to that. And so we drilled down to the causes. We, um, there was no standard orders for some of the patients receiving chemotherapy. So every time a patient would come in, the physician would handwrite each order. It was individual. They had to be written with each visit. It was very time consuming and very tedious. And there wasn't a lot of counter checks. And so one of the things that we looked at was really improving to make sure that we were delivering care not only quickly, but also safely. And uh, we didn't have a pharmacist that was just oncology specific when we first started. And so as part of our growth, we'll highlight some of that as well. And just for everybody to know what we were really targeting, what was really important to us, is making sure that we had a s appropriate turnaround time, meaning that patients within an hour, their treatments would be initiated and that they would be treated um, with the best care we could possibly give. And really, all along the bottom line, making sure that our patient satisfaction was never harmed. The infusion center has one of the highest satisfactions in the hospital, and the nurses there strive really hard to make sure all of the patients are always treated with the respect. And so as far as improvement work that was implemented, we did, um, with the thanks from the board and all of the administration, we did implement Beacon, which is a really safe, effective electronic medical record upgrade, which helps us with all of the orders and um, it helps the physicians. It, it's um, really improved safety and time for the pharmacists. We do have a dedicated oncology pharmacist and we also have um, implemented within the system. Another thing we encountered a lot is there were a lot of phone calls back and forth and the phone calls were leading to interruptions and then it's hard once you get a phone call then to go back to exactly where you were. And so we implemented within Epic, we implemented a dot system and it, we could put notes back to each other where then the person could see it timely but it wasn't impacting their care that they were actively doing. And then we have regular communication with pharmacy and really just a lot of communication with everybody, the physician and the pharmacist and really just opening the dialogue up. And so this is a, a little highlight of our improvement work. Like I said, we started in 2017 with some of the process improvements and it did take us some time to meet our goal and we're doing great here and then we have little hiccups here, um, but we're doing great overall. One of the nurses around here said, when can we stop measuring it? I said, we really can't because part of process improvement is we continue to want to monitor and make sure that we don't slip backwards. And then we looked at patient satisfaction. Our patient satisfaction scores has remained above the 95th percentile. But what we really wanted to look at with this project we found in the beginning in 2017 that we read every single patient satisfaction comment. The patient's experience is really important to us. So every comment that was written, Sherry and I went through, and there were seven comments that were actually negatively related to wait time, that they felt like they were waiting extended periods of time and wanted us to really work on that. And then in 2018, there were three, and 2019, zero. But actually, it's even better than that. We had three favorable comments that they felt like there was no wait time. <laughs> so I think it was a great win. But as part of this process and improvement, it did lead us to a second problem. When we changed one thing, it led us to the next. So Sherry? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rochelle. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, everybody, for having us tonight. I did what Rochelle had said. It's been um, nice to be um, in a community or in a workplace that's very supportive. So thank you. 
Okay, so as Rochelle was saying, one project led to another project, and um, one of the, our goals was, of course, to decrease the time patients were waiting for their medications. And with that, um, one of the ideas came from one of our huddles from a nurse said, why don't we um, get our supplies ready ahead of time? You know, have them ready for the patients when they're waiting, their medical supplies. So um, that started a process of looking at that. And then um, the, one of the issues that we discovered later on downstream, though, uh, some of the charges were being missed on um, and were not being applied to the patient record. Um, so then we started the A3. We initiated that in January of 2019. Um, and so when, as Rochelle was describing, the A3 problem solving and the analysis began. Um, we found that it was multifactorial. It, there was a lot of contributing factors. Um, just to give you a little background, before 2019, um, we implemented two processes to which the nurses could get supplies out of the PIXIS and kind of bypass the check-in process, and so to get them out quicker. But that kind of caused some downstream effect, um, and so we found that uh, charges weren't being reconciled correctly. Um, there was a large amount of work that had to go into um, correcting charges for the medical supply charges. Um, we found that there were incorrect uh, codes and charges attached to some supplies, like charges from the supply PIXIS um, would go to the EPIC and they, they weren't always correct. Um, and again, there was just a large amount of rework that had to be done, hours of rework to get these um, correct the errors before the patients were billed. Um, so we came up with some targets. We wanted to um, have the nurses to be able to um, use the supplies that they were using at the bedside and then also just um, be able to put the charges in at the point of care. And also we wanted to come up with a, a target. We decided um, to have that target be le less than 5% incorrect or missed charges um, per month. And then that would, re um, and also that would be before um, the patients were billed, so requiring um, rework, so less than 5%. So um, during uh, all of our improvements and our PD, uh, you know, the plan, do, check, uh, act cycles of lean, we had all of this going on simultaneously. We developed a new charge capture system in Epic. Um, as part of the regular flow of, of EPIC work for nurses at the point of care. We updated codes in EPIC so there was more accurate charging. And then we replaced our um, kind of an expensive PIXIS, supply PIXIS with uh, the Kanban system for supply, for resupplying and that saved the hospital money so that was great. Um, and then we developed some standard work for medical supply capture for both the nursing and then the manager, um, which is me. <laughs> so um, that was very helpful. And then we developed a, the audit. The audit that I use um, every day, uh, it's a um, it's actual report made by IT that comes to my um, email. And then I look at that, all of the charges that were done from the day before, and I, and I um, re reconcile them in real time. So it only takes like about five minutes now, which is wonderful so um, and during the whole process there you know we were looking at um, you know across the organization we discovered that there was a, an opportunity so that you know because there was variation in the way we um, handle medical supplies so now there's an opportunity to engage other unit-based councils for, to develop best practices related to this and as you can see here at least this little pointer um, here, when we started in January, the quarter of January 2019, we were about 73% of patients having missed charges or inaccurate charges um, applied to their uh, char uh, charts. And then we went all the way down to 11% in March of 2019. And now we're at about 4.5% in August of 2019. And that, in, again, is only taking about five minutes of time to uh, reconcile that 4.5, and we're meeting our target. So that was really great. Um, and here's an example of our weekly huddle. This is our team picture with most everybody there. Um, this is a weekly huddle. We meet on Tuesdays from 8 to 8.30. It's interprofessional. We discuss all of our improvement work. We talk about how we're doing. We generate ideas. Everybody has a voice there. Rochelle's very good at um, asking everybody to kind of give their input and going around the circle. And so it's just a way of us to um, you know, share best practices, give patient updates, and we have great leadership support. And then on the left is an example of the minutes that Rochelle sends out um, after the meeting's done, and it's a good way to 
monitor what we're doing, keep it as a report, and then for people who aren't able to be there. And then um, lastly, wrapping up, these are some common features from Lean that uh, really helped us be successful, is kind of understanding what's going on with the real work and going to the Gemba, going and seeing what's happening with the work that's being done, like looking at what nursing is doing as far as like pulling supplies, supplies, looking, we even went to materials management to see what their, you know, their processes were and worked collaboratively with Victoria. And then the importance of having um, staff engagement. I mean, can't kind of stress that enough. Our nurses are very engaged. They're very involved. They um, take ownership of problem solving. I think um, I think they feel like they have a voice in our unit, and um, they really embraced the changes and were just uh, a wonderful team to work with. Uh, very appreciative. Um, and then you know we did have a multidisciplinary approach. We worked with. Uh, everyone across the departments, and we had great leadership and physician support. And just lastly, you know, improvement is always ongoing. Like Rochelle had said, you know, it's never stagnant, and we're always looking to improve our processes. What can we do next? What can we build on next? And from this project, from the medical supply project, now we're looking at standardizing the way we're doing our infusion so that every nurse is doing using the tubings in the same mannerisms too so that we can have more efficiency that way as well so and that is it and i just want to thank you guys again thank you, thank thank you, you for having us thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you very very much it's nice to see that uh, infusion center doing so well that's very exciting i remember Many years ago, my wife needed uh, some infusion therapy, and my, it was all over town, it seemed. It's nice to have it going well. Thank you, thank you. We're now ready for our quality report. Uh, we'll have that from uh, Mary Bullron. And I'm also going oh, to quickly, we also good. have Dr. Diane Martin that is going to, to join us this evening for the presentation on influenza um, prevention. So I just want to introduce Dr. Uh, Martin. I know she has presented before, but um, Dr. Martin became a member of Washington Hospital's medical staff in 1984 and served as chair of the Department of Medicine from 1993 to 1995. Dr. Martin has performed many leadership roles at Washington, including chair of the Clinical Evaluation Committee, which which includes pharmacy and therapeutics and infection control. Dr. Martin has been a physician champion for our 5 Million Lives campaign, where she analyzed data and educated her peers on infection control issues, specifically MRSA. Dr. Martin attended school in Charleston, South Carolina, after which she completed her internship and residency at the University of Kentucky School of Medicine. She received a fellowship in infectious diseases at the UC Davis School of Medicine. Dr. Martin serves on the board of director. Uh, Board of Directors of Life Elder Care. She also sees patients in her practice with Washington Township Medical Foundation. Short. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing. Okay. Now we'll do the slides. So you'll be good. Okay. Um, so we wanted to present to you the information, updated information on influenza vaccine and prevention. Uh, so we're going to run through a number of slides and then take questions at the end if you like. So people want to know what is influenza. So influenza is a virus that causes respiratory infections and most people use just the word flu, um, but it's highly contagious, it's very severe in certain populations, especially the elderly, the immunocompromised. In the United States, the flu season runs October through March. In Alameda County, we see it run a little bit longer, October through April. Most people get influenza and get sick lasts about two weeks. Um, however, people who are more seriously ill, have underlying other medical problems, can get much sicker. So we think that approximately um, 50 million people will get sick with influenza. About 22 million will need to see their healthcare provider. 
Almost a million will need hospitalization, and upwards of about 79,000 actually die from influenza. Influenza is spread through air or touch or droplets for coughing, sneezing, uh, close contact. People can be infected by touching an object or a surface that has the virus, and then when they touch their face, mouth, nose, then they transmit the virus to themselves. The flu can spread even if you are personally not feeling sick because symptoms may not show up for another 24 to 48 hours after having been infected. Most common symptoms are fever, chills, sore throat, runny or stuffy nose, body aches, and fatigue. Other complications that are obviously much more serious, and we see in immunocompromised people, elderly or the very young, and obviously pregnant women as well. Secondary bacterial infections, pneumonia, neuromuscular complications, lung infections, cardiac complications, and obviously hospitalization and mortality or death. Flu shot is administered by a needle injection. Um, I'll touch base on the um, aerosolized in just a minute. So the 2019 to the 2020 influenza season, the vaccines administered to Washington Hospital is the most comprehensive that we have available. There are four strains. An ordinary flu vaccine has three. We are offering the four strain. We often call it a quad. They have two of the influenza A, including the H1N1 and the H3N2, which is the newer one, and then two influenza B strains. The Centers for Disease Control recommends annual flu shot, and we want to make sure everybody can get their flu shot. Um, it's recommended for children six months and older as an important step of protection. Uh, vaccine is also strongly recommended for people who are at high risk. So that would be adults 65 and older, um, people who have other chronic conditions, asthma, heart disease, cancer. Uh, children from six months to eight years may sometimes need two doses of vaccine. Pregnant women is an area where people get a little bit sort of skittish about it, but we think that pregnant women should definitely get flu vaccine, and it does protect the baby as well. So high-risk individuals that have had Guillain-Barre probably should not get the vaccine. So how does a flu shot work? Should we actually get one? Answer, yes, definitely. You want your own immune system to get used to the virus so that when you do get exposed, your body's prepared and ready to fight it off. And the reason that it's changed year to year is because there's certain variations in the influenza strain. But your body actually builds on that exposure year to year, even though it's not specifically that specific virus per year, your body does recognize the influenza virus. And even though you may have had vaccines for a different virus in previous years, your body builds on that knowledge and in, in your immune system. So people who get flu shots have a 40 to 60% lower chance of getting seriously ill than people who don't get flu shots. So the question is, do I need a flu shot every year? The answer is yes. So the de it's designed to protect against the most common viruses, and again, they change from year to year, um, and we try to predict it along with CDC to figure out which is the most likely virus for this year. We recommend that people start getting the vaccine in October. Vaccines are effective throughout the year. It generally takes about two weeks to develop an immune response. So even though you may put off getting the vaccine in October when we'd like for you to, it's never too late. So whether it's October, November, December, January, never too late. So can, people wanna know, can the vaccine give me the flu? The answer is no. Uh, there's no live virus in the shot. So people do sometimes get some side effects. They may get a little bit of a, 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 a fever or muscle aches, but those sometimes people mistake for the flu, but it's not influenza. In rare instances, individuals can experience a little bit of discomfort, fever that may last for up to two days after the vaccine. Usually symptoms are obviously a lot less serious than if you got influenza yourself. Flu vaccines, again, are updated with the latest strains that we try to predict based on CDC guidelines. Um, obviously, as I said, one of the A's is different and the other A is the same as last year. The other vaccine that I alluded to is not an injectable one, it's a nasal spray. Um, most of the infectious disease groups do not recommend this unless it's specifically why they can't take an injection. So it is approved for non-pregnant 
patients two years to 49. And there are certain people who should not get the nasal spray because of a weakened immune system. So in general, we don't think that the nasal spray works as well. If somebody is truly risk avoiding getting an injection, it's certainly better than nothing. People with egg allergies should talk to their doctor specifically because that's not a total contraindication to getting the influenza vaccine. And as I'll notice in a minute, there is a recombinant vaccine, which is specifically um, safe for people who have egg allergies. So currently Washington Hospital, what are we doing? We're screening and vaccinating all eligible patients, all eligible patients. Flu vaccines available seven days a week at our urgent care. We have mandatory vaccination or proof of vaccination in 100% of our healthcare workers. So Washington Hospital's patient first ethic, we wanna protect ourselves, we wanna protect our patients, and it's mandatory. If declined, we require that they do mandatory masking, again, from October to April. And this is also in conjunction with recommendations from Alameda County. We provide an annual flu blitz that we're gonna be starting in a couple of weeks where we reach out to all of the employees. We have clinics that we hold um, daily at different shifts so we can uh, encounter everybody who's working on different shifts. And we also have a cart that goes around to the floors and make sure that we get everybody vaccinated. Prevention is also very important. My favorite subject is hand hygiene. So washing our hands is a very good prevention against influenza. Vaccine obviously better, but hand hygiene never hurts. Wearing a face mask. If you're sick or you're coughing or your coworker's coughing, hand them the mask. We have masks at the front desk of the hospital, the urgent care clinics, all the WTMF clinics have masks right at our front desk. As soon as somebody walks in with coughing, we very gently hand them a mask. And pediatrics does this with these little teeny tiny masks, so everybody gets a mask. So we do regular evaluation and analysis of our employees that get vaccinations. This is done on a quarterly um, evaluation and also monitoring anything that looks like influenza <clears throat> that's coming through the emergency department. So the Joint Commission has also taken this on as a very serious measure. So they wants to make sure that it's considered prime importance, so they made it a measure that we adhere to. So inpatient discharges six months or older, screened and vaccinated prior to discharge in the October to March, or in our case, April months. Alameda County has also taken this on as a serious measure, and that they want to see how many of our hospital personnel have been vaccinated each flu season. So the Healthy People 2020 has targeted a 90% vaccination rate for the healthcare personnel. As you can see, Washington Hospital patient first, we are there. So the red line is the 93% and below that the 90%, we're at 98. So Washington Hospital is there for our patients and there for each other. This just tells you the breakdown. So by our employees, we have between 90 and 92%. We have about eight to 10% that decline for various reasons. And they are obviously mandated to use a mask anytime they're in patient um, areas. If they're in the cafeteria or they're outside, they're not required to wear a mask, but anytime they're in a patient area, they're required to wear a mask. So what can we do? What can an individual do? Obviously get the flu vaccine, get it every year. Practice good hand hygiene. Cover your mouth if you're sneezing, wash your hands frequently. The flu is a virus. So going to your healthcare provider and asking for an antibiotic is not gonna work for influenza. There are specific influenza antibiotics, but a regular antibiotic, penicillin, Keflex, those things will not work for influenza. So again, you can get the influenza vaccine through our urgent care, which is open eight to eight. Um, and then also we have walk-in flu clinics, uh, Monday through Friday, 11 to four, and Saturday, 12 to four. Appointments are not needed. Um, there are cash discounts, otherwise 100% uh, coverage by Med Medicare. And most of the insurances also cover influenza vaccine. The bottom line is if you think you have flu, get evaluated, get checked. Um, that you can make sure that you don't have something else. And if you are sick, we encourage people, if they're sick, stay home. Uh, people want to send their kids to work or send the kids to school and they go to work. We encourage people not to send kids to school and not to go to work if you're sick. So vaccinate, wash your hands, stay home if you're sick. And then you can come see your doctor. Questions? 
You're a great cheerleader. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate we appreciate your effort on that. Uh, yeah, I agree. I just wanted to um, add a couple words about. Uh, yeah, first of all, yes, thank you absolutely, Dr. Martin, for. Um, being one of the best physician champions for this. I mean, she is um, absolutely out there every day encouraging the hand hygiene and really dispelling a lot of the myths that you see around the influenza vaccine, as um, I think she further reiterated tonight. But in addition to that, some of the successes that um, she um, brought forward with um, how we've been able to get our employees vaccinated at such a high rate, uh, which makes a huge difference on exposure to patients who are already sick. Um, that has come from a tremendous amount of effort uh, working with our employee health team. I mean, they work at this diligently, you know, bringing the roving carts around, doing all the education, doing all the blitzes. So um, those are two areas that I think have been a huge help in helping us get to this outcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let, the, let there be no doubt. Vaccination is the way to go. Yeah, that's the message, right? Yeah. Thank you again. We're now ready for our quality report. Uh, I'm sorry, finance report from Chris Henry. It will be a quality report. <laughs> okay, so tonight we'll be looking at uh, the operational financial results for Washington Hospital for July 2019, the first month of our fiscal year. Uh, and it was an encouraging start. Um, average daily census for the month came in 25.2 uh, above the budget at 176.9, that's about 16.6% uh, favorable variance there. Um, admissions uh, were 79 above budget at 1,022. Uh, our patient days likewise were about 16.6% uh, above budget at 5,484. Uh, that's 780 more than we expected in the budget. Outpatient observation equivalent days for the month came in 11 above the budget at 177, and our average length of stay based on discharges uh, came as expected, came in above budget uh, given the other, uh, the admissions and the uh, patient day numbers. Our average length of stay came in at 5.29, we'd expected 4.99. Looking at utilization, case mix in the uh, index for the month was higher than we expected at 1.499. We had uh, generally in July, we're not seeing uh, uh, that severe of cases. Uh, we expected 1.425. We had uh, deliveries for the month came in at 137, just one below the budget. Um, pretty good number uh, based on what we've been seeing. Uh, surgical cases were 51 above the budget at 416. That includes our joint replacement cases that were 29 above the budget at 162. Uh, neurosurgical cases were two above budget at 26. Our cardiac surgical cases were two above budget at 12. And, and those two, those four cases there are, are significant. You know, it's, uh, those are, those are uh, complex cases and really help the bottom line. Um, cath lab procedures for the month were 37 above budget at 411. Uh, our outpatient visits were 11% above budget at 8,096. We'd expected 7,288. Uh, and our emergency room uh, came in pretty close to budget, 32 above the budget at 4,448. Quick look at the cath lab activity, pretty consistent with what we've been seeing uh, over the last number of months. Uh, cardiac and peripheral vascular uh, procedures pretty even in the mix followed by non-vascular interventional radiology and neural interventional radiology. Uh, looking at productivity, uh, with the higher level of activity, we did have higher FTEs. Our productive FTEs were a little more than 100 above budget at 1,337.7. We had 207.5 non-productive FTEs for the month. Uh, actually lower than budget and you know this is when folks were trying to get out with this level of activity I think they had a hard time doing that so we ended up with total FTEs uh, 73.9 above budget at 1545.2 uh, however our FTEs per adjusted occupied bed which is our productivity measure came in below budget at a little over six would expected 6.7 so uh, again staffing appropriately for the activity, maybe even a little light. 
All this uh, translates to pretty good uh, gross revenue numbers. The gross revenue, uh, gross patient revenue for the month, a little over $25 million above the budget at $196,318,000. Uh, however, our deductions from revenue for the month came in high at 79.16. Uh, really uh, was due to payer mix, um, uh, and a lot of it occurred in the contractual area. The, the mix of governmental uh, sponsored patients, Medicare and Medi-Cal, was higher than expected in the budget, uh, and the offset to that was that PPO was lower than budget. And it doesn't take big moves in that to translate into into some pretty big dollars. Um, we did have some help from our provision from for bad debt and charity. Uh, you know, uh, with gross revenue being above budget, 14.7 percent, you'd expect that to follow. It actually came in below budget, 4 percent, so that really helped out. Uh, uh, and again, our total deductions uh, coming in at 155. 0.4 million, uh, about 22.6 million over what we had expected. But again, that's that's on a 14% increase in gross revenue. Um, so we end up uh, March uh, coming up with t uh, net operating revenue actually about 2.5 million dollars above the budget at 41 million 340 thousand dollars. Operating expenses for the month came in a little under $1.7 million above budget. Have a couple of offsets going on there. Um, uh, as you would expect, our salaries and wages were above budget, about $1.1 million with the higher FTEs. Um, and we had to use some overtime, you know, to make up for that unexpected volume. Um, our supplies were about 810,000 above the budget with, you know, the increased uh, level of activity in the OR and the cath lab. Um, uh, purchase services and pro fees offset that by about 112,000, largely driven by lower um, professional fees, you know, uh, our, um, we provide um, some guaranteed incomes on our uh, our pediatric diagnostic clinic, the oncology service, you know, we have the, with our agreements with UC and the special care nursery and um, the, those fees are offset by the amount of billings that are collected uh, by the professionals uh, and those have been higher than expected as the vo their volumes have grown, they've offset those fees. So uh, a large part of that $112,000 resulted from that. Um, our, our, uh, also offsetting that was our marketing uh, costs. They were $68,000 below budget, and I think this early in the year, that's just a timing difference that we'll probably see uh, make itself up later in the year. So we ended up with operating income, and again, we're looking at our Governmental Accounting Standards Board presentation. Um, uh, operating income about $846,000 better than budget at a, th a million, uh, two hundred eight thousand and uh, I just want to note that's about $3.1 million better than our results for July of 2018 on that operating bottom line. So some pretty good improvement month to month, and hopefully we'll continue to see that during the year. Um, Non-operating income for the month uh, actually came in at a $320,000 loss. We uh, That's about uh, $258,000 greater than we expected in the budget. We did have a $391,000 unrealized loss on our investments. So we end um, July with a total bottom line from a GASB perspective, uh, almost $600,000 better than budget at $888,000. Take a quick look at the Financial Accounting Standards Board format. This is how Wall Street might adjust the financials we just looked at, uh, when they do an analysis of us, they would reclassify um, uh, the uh, revenue bond portion of our interest expense back up into operations. Uh, they would remove that unrealized loss on our investments and our tax revenue and the related interest uh, related to the general obligation bond debt service. Um, so we would end up with operating income about $922,000 better than budget from a FASB perspective at $432,000. Non-operating income pretty close to budget at $582,000 and a total bottom line uh, $920,000 better than budget from a FASB perspective at a little over a million dollars.
So are there any questions on, on FASB and GASB? Quick look at EBITDA, that's our earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And, and uh, again, we try to isolate out um, the non-cash uh, portions of the income statements you just saw, uh, as well as the interest expense to figure out how much income the operation is providing to cover the interest expense and uh, additional capital uh, and routine spending. Uh, and uh, once we make those adjustments and pull depreciation out of the operating bottom line, we end up with EBITDA of a little under $5.3 million. You look down below, uh, when we pull out our interest expense from our non-operating uh, line, we end up with non-operating income at about a million six thirty. So in total, the operation provided about $6.9 million of income to cover that debt service and uh, you know whatever routine and ongoing capital needs we have. So pretty good month uh, for the first month of the year. It was a quality report. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Chris. Now we'll have our <laughs> hospital operations report. Yes, I'd like to present the August 2019 uh, preliminary results and. Um, August continued to be busy in some of the areas, as, as you will see. Uh, gross revenue of $181.8 million for August was above budget by $7.6 million and above August of 2018 by $12.3 million. Inpatient gross revenue of $126.2 million was above budget by $6.9 million and $5 million above August of 2018. And outpatient gross revenue of 55.6 million was above budget by 762,000 and 7.2 million above August of 2018. Moving on to major drivers of revenue variance, uh, the cath lab procedures were above budget uh, by 154, uh, driving cath lab revenue up by 3.1 million. Inpatient days were above budget by 263, driving room and board revenue up by 2.3 million. The higher level of inpatient activity drove ancillary services revenue above budget by 2.3 million. Our key uh, census statistics, our average length of stay of 5.45 was above the budget of 4.93. The average length of stay was longer than the August of 2018 um, average length of stay of 4.75. Outpatient observation days were 26 above budget at 194, um, and observation days were 23 above August of 2018. And the average daily census of 162.5 was above the budget of 154.0 by 8.5, and the average daily census was 10.6 above August of 2018. Uh, emissions uh, were on budget at, at nine, 969. Chris says this happens maybe how often? <laughs> once in probably, probably three years. <laughs> once in three years. <laughs> I asked that question because I. <laughs> even, a, so. even a broken clock. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> emissions for <laughs> emissions for the month were 36 below August of 2018. Uh, Patient days of 5,037 were above budget by 263, and patient days for the month were two, 327 above August of 2018. Looking at our surgical trends, uh, total surgical cases in August of 390 were slightly above the budget of 387. Uh, surgical cases were 22 above August of 2018. Inpatient surgeries were 22 above budget at 244 and four above the August 2018 volume. Lastly, outpatient surgeries were 19 and below budget at 146, but 18 above August of 2018. Uh, more specifically, looking at our surgical activity, our joint replacement surgeries were below budget by four, um, and they were all, uh, joint replacement surgeries were four below August of 2018. Our neurosurgical procedures were below budget by one, um, and they were neuros neurosurgical procedures were two above budget of, uh, compared to tw August of 2018. Our cardiac surgical procedures were above budget by three, and they were cardiac surgical procedures were seven above budget above um, August of 2018. 
And then our general surgical procedures were above budget by five, and they were 17 above August of 2018. Looking at cath lab trends, um, cath lab procedures uh, for August of 514 were 154 above budget and 167 above August of 2018. Inpatient cath lab procedures were above budget by 128 at 328 and 141 above August of 2018 but, um, actuals. Outpatient cath lab procedures were above budget by 26 and above the prior year by 26. In terms of the specific cath lab activity, neurointerventional radiology procedures were on budget at five and four above August of 2018 volume. Cardiac procedures were below budget by eight and 16 uh, below the um, August of 2018 actuals. Non-vascular interventional radiology procedures were above budget by 34 and 15 above the August of 2018 volume. Peripheral vascular procedures were above budget by 128 and 164 above for the same period last year. Our deliveries uh, for August were 144, uh, which was above the budget by four, and deliveries were four below August of 2018's uh, budget. Looking at our non-ER outpatient trends, um, non-emergency outpatient visits of 8,185 were above budget by 507. Uh, these visits were above the August of 2018 um, volume by 372. Uh, you can see our, our infusion uh, center visits were above budget by 97. You saw some of that in the, the previous presentation. Cath or lab visits were above by above budget by 175, and X-ray visits were above budget by 240. Looking at our emergency room visits, um, they were 4,252, which were below the budget by eight, but were above the same period last year by 199 visits. Our uh, preliminary productivity indicators um, show that our productive FTEs were above budget by 82.7 at 1,348.6, uh, given our higher uh, volumes. Our non-productive FTEs were below budget by 9.5 at 179.9. So our, our total FTEs of 1,528.5 were above budget by 73.2. Our productive FTEs per adjusted occupied bed um, of 5.76 uh, were above the budget of 5.63. And our total FTEs uh, per adjusted occupied bed of 6.53 were very close to the budget of 6.47. Looking at some of our other operating um, operational statistics, Washington Outpatient Surgery Center had 586 cases in August. This was 47 above the budget of 539 and 81 above the August 2018 volume. Clinic visits of 3,483 were below budget by 51 for the month of August, but 258 above the August 2018 volume. Our Washington Urgent Care was 109 above budget, Nakamura Clinic 77 above budget. Our Warm Springs Clinic had a couple of physicians that were off and was down by 131 visits. Uh, our preliminary payer mix, um, as you can see, for the month of August, government-sponsored patient revenue made up 71.1% of total gross revenue which is below the budget of 71.4% and below last year's percentage of 72.3%. HMO revenue was 3.1% of gross revenue, which is higher than the budget of 2.5% and higher than last year's percentage of 2.4%. PPO revenue was 23.2 of gross revenue, which is below the budget of 23.7%, but higher than last year's percentage of 22.1%. And private pay, uh, revenue was 2.6 percent of, rev of gross revenue, which is higher than the budget of 2.4 percent, but lower than last year's percentage of 3.2 percent. 
Our key financial st uh, statistics, our days cash on hand uh, for August ended at 158 days, an improvement of three days from last month. Uh, days of gross revenue and accounts receivable were at 54, and there was $845,460 in charity care applications pending or approved uh, in August, which was um, below that of the prior month. And lastly, our summary of um, homeless patient activity. There were 144 homeless patient encounters in August of 2019. Um, homeless patients with more than one encounter in, uh, accounted for 40 of the 144 encounters. Estimated incremental cost of Senate Bill 1152 for the month of August is 54,000 approximately. Estimated total unreimbursed cost of homeless care for the month of August is 153,000. Estimated total unreimbursed cost of homeless care for fiscal year 20 year to date uh, is 846,262. That's the month of August. Thank you. We now have two action items uh, to consider. Uh, Mr. Wallace will present those. Uh, item A. Uh, Mr. President, um, in accordance with district law policies and procedures, I move that the board directors authorize the chief executive officer officer to proceed with the purchase of the Shimatsu digital portable uh, for an amount not to exceed $152,404. Second. We have a motion and a second on that. Uh, it'd be good to explain that just a little bit, Kimberly. So the medical energy department currently has two portable units that are 17 to 21 years old. These units have been at the sort of the formal end of their life for some time and now parts uh, are getting harder for us to find. So the recommendation at this point is to move forward with replacing one of the units at this time. The Shimatsu digital portable unit that we are recommending for purchase is similar to the ones we have uh, with, that we have right now over at the Morris Hyman Critical Care Pavilion. And the radiation dose is 25% less than the older units and the image quality is, is significantly better. Great. Any comments on that? Any questions? It's good to have that lower radiation dose. Yes, it is. Beautiful thing. Yep. D, if you'd take the roll. Director Stewart. Aye. Director Nicholson. Aye. Director Wallace. Aye. Director Epen. Aye. Director Yee. Aye. That motion passes. We'll move to item B. Mr. President, in accordance with district law policy and procedures, I move that the Board of Directors authorize the Chief Executive Officer to enter into the necessary contracts and proceed with the purchase of software and implementation services for a total amount not to exceed $786,411. Second. We have a motion and a second. Again, Kimberly? Yes. Um, this project will, uh, will implement interoperability between Epic Electronic Physician Entered Orders and the Infusion Pump for delivery of IV medications. So current practice, uh, practice requires our nurses to manually program the pump with the physician order parameters, leaving room for risk of manual programming errors. With integration, the pumps can be uploaded with exact physician orders. By scanning a barcode on the patient armband, the pump and the medication, the RN, the nurse can confirm uh, the right patient, the right medication, and the right dose. And data from the infusion pump flows back into the medical record, further improving the medication process by ensuring proper documentation. So it's another one of those initiatives that, that we are bringing forward that is budgeted in terms of looking at ways to improve our, our medication safety process. Great. Any comments on that? Questions? No, I just agree with the medication safety. I think this will help significantly. Yeah. D. Director Stewart. Aye. Director Nicholson. Aye. Director Wallace. Aye. Director Epen. Aye. Director Yee. Aye. Good. That, that concludes our uh, agenda for this evening. We do have a need for a closed session, so at this point we'll be adjourning to a closed session. Thank you. At this point, we'll reconvene to an open session and we'll announce that uh, no reportable action was taken, taken care of in the closed session. There being no further business this evening, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>